good morning everybody. Um, today I want to talk about that sometimes you can do nice and unusual things with the tool that surrounds uh, that surround you and the question of my talk whether Flink is a convenient abstraction layer for yarn. And I will start with an introduction uh, to begin convincing you that it actually is. So yarn opened up a Hadoop platform for many more developers. It allowed to implement their own applications. It offered great uh, flexibility and the evidence for this is that we, have, uh, we, can, we can see many applications emerging apart from MapReduce, Stas, Flink, Spark and Flink has been really great in using this opportunity. That's why we love Flink at RG but I will talk a bit later but n uh, now let's talk a bit more about Yarn and uh, what uh, opportunities uh, Yarn brought in is uh, ability to have new programming models in, to, in addition to MapReduce. We have more alternatives to cover cases where the MapReduce paradigm doesn't feel, uh, fit really well. Uh, we have more flexibility in, our, in these applications to express other um, more operations on the data. Uh, Yarn offered elasticity of the cluster and all of this uh, was possible because uh, developers can write their own uh, Yarn applications to do distribute computation across cluster. Uh, but sometimes you want to do something really simple and uh, write your own application to distribute load across the cluster. But unfortunately, writing your own Yarn application is not so easy. And there is a b pieces of code that I took from the documentation. Of course, you cannot read it, but it's quite, uh, uh, quite a few lines of code for just a simple uh, Hello World application. And of course, this makes it uh, too complicated, tedious, are prone to write it, and we have a feeling that uh, like somebody uh, uh, has done things um, like uh, things already in this area. And uh, the usual developer, when he's dealing with his own job, doesn't have to think about these low-level details. And probably that's because that's why uh, there were some frameworks emerging up, uh, for example, Apache Twill that try to solve this problem, but in our scenarios it was also not easy enough to use. And also, in addition, it would be great if the framework that you use is actually, you use it on an everyday basis so you don't have to learn something new. I mean, if you still want to distribute your computations across the cluster and everything else fails, of course you want, can create some ad hoc solutions that will you know, distribute code via Puppet to the nodes and then you will uh, run your command via SSH, uh, but then you still have problem with how you split your input data, how you aggregate, how you deal with failures, and it just hasn't, doesn't, doesn't have to be like this. And uh, all other things work pretty nicely with Flink for us, uh, and we thought probably we should try Flink uh, in this case as well. And uh, Flink already gave us lots of benefits at ResearchGate and my colleague Michael Hoisler yesterday mentioned many of them and his talk every day is Flink. But to summarize, we uh, rewrote our MapReduce jobs that they made them more readable, more compact and therefore easier to understand and easier to maintain. We got rid of uh, ugly hive queries that were uh, running for ages. One of the examples were, uh, was that there were some queries that ran for hours and now it takes less than 20 minutes. And of course, probably these hive queries were not really well optimized and if you tweak them, probably you would achieve better performance, but uh, that's exactly the point of Fling, that you don't have to um, think about these things and in most of the cases, everything uh, works nicely out of the box. Of course, Fling made it easier to orchestrate the subtask of uh, bigger jobs for us. And uh, nice, the nice additional feature that I think Fling offers is some sort of documentation of your workflow when you run your program. 
and you see in the job tracker UI interface how these tasks are interconnected, and that already gives you benefits like some sort of documentation. Actually, we also have uh, some examples uh, in our practice for applying iterative machine learning algorithm algorithms, but today I want to talk about distributing computational tasks across a cluster. And we have a real use case for that. It's uh, MongoDB to, um, to our format bridge. And uh, what this tool is basically does for us, it's used to dump Mongo Live DB data into the Avro format on HDFS. Of course, now we have some other uh, solutions to make this dumping even, even faster, but still we use this tool quite a lot when we need to resync and, and do stuff like that. So how many guys are you familiar with MongoDB, actually? Okay, and with Avro? Okay, so uh, nonetheless, I will briefly summarize uh, what MongoDB is. MongoDB is a uh, schema agnostic, document-oriented database that uh, makes it easy to shard, to, to scale horizontally, to shard data. And Avro is a serialization framework uh, and a format. And yeah, you can think about maybe it's conceptually, conceptually similar to Protobuf or Thrift. Anyway, so what this tool does, in essence, it uh, reads documents from MongoDB. It converts them to our records uh, using our converter, given the provided schema, and uh, persists them on HDFS. And this project uh, evolved over time. At the very beginning, it was really simple utility, just one thread program, then we would try to optimize, we made it multi-threaded, and then at some point, we uh, felt the need that we need to distribute this import process uh, across the cluster. And the reason for it was that at some point, we had so many imports running in parallel that were, uh, were CPU-bound. And of course, the, this Avro, um, MongoDB to Avro converter was pretty efficient, but then still when you run hundreds of imports with several threads and one machine just cannot cope with it. And plus, we wanted to distribute uh, uh, the load on HDFS. So to showcase uh, the evolution of the project, I will go through uh, briefly through the, uh, all three stages of the evolution of the project, and I will be begin with explaining the first version, which was pretty simple. We have MongoDB, we instantiated the cursor, we went through the data, we fed each MongoDB document into the, uh, our MongoDB to our converter, produced our records, and persisted them on HDFS. But very quickly, we, it became apparent that we need to optimize it somehow, and most of our collections were sharded anyway, so we started to think about how we can parallelize some stuff. And uh, for this, we decided to use uh, MongoDB internals, how it stores data on MongoDB shards. So this is an example of one shard, and one MongoDB shard contains a chunk of uh, documents, many chunks. One chunk contains an ordered list of documents by some ID, which is called the shard key. And um, we wanted to utilize these internals in order to control the load on the MongoDB cluster, and at the same time have a deterministic way of splitting our uh, collection for input. So that's the version number two of the Avronga tool. Uh, and what we basically did, we were collecting chunk information for each particular shard. And we have typically limited amount of threads uh, that are devoted to particular shard. Each thread we're reading a chunk from the corresponding sh uh, shard and apply the same business logic that is our MongoDB to our converter and then persisted the data to HDFS. You can think about the uh, MongoDB to our converter as a black box for the sake of this presentation. But then, uh, as I mentioned before, it became uh, 
we, we, we were CPU bound and it was clear that we need uh, to do something about it. At the very beginning we tried to think about just putting this instances of this tool on different nodes or write our own uh, Yarn application, but then it was too complicated. And then we got an idea, okay, maybe we can do nicer things with Flink that would solve the problems uh, relatively easier. Uh, and the key solution to that was to implement our uh, custom input format that would create as many queues as we have shards and then will consume uh, uh, the chunk information from the longest queue and will fit it into the mapper, uh, flat map operator. And this flat map operator actually works exactly the same as the computational unit within the sharded version. And what was left is actually we had to collect the data and we had to implement our own generic hour output format that deals with generic hour records but not with specific or reflect data re records because we wanted to stay agnostic to the uh, class path available to this tool. And uh, the advantage of this tool over the previous sharded version of the tool, apart that it can be distributed across the cluster, uh, now, it, uh, since uh, the queues of the chunks per shard stay more or less balanced, we uh, give a bit more attention to the shards that tend to be a bit slower, and in such a way, uh, all mappers uh, finish more or less at the same time, and uh, the previous tool had a problem when some slower shards were slowing down the whole finishing time of the tool. So the conclusions were that we are no longer bound to uh, the CPU and the import times reduce really significantly. We have examples where like the collection that took to, to be imported like six hours, uh, took two and a half hours and we reduced time for, for some other collections from three and a half hours to two hours. And the benefits are really apparent because with really few lines of code, it's just basically a custom, you know, custom input format and just gluing custom input format with a flat map operator uh, gave us possibility to distribute this application with no pain uh, to, the, uh, to, to the Hadoop cluster. And at the same time, we also preserve the same command line interface so that the transition from the sharded version of this tool uh, to the Flink version of this tool was just minimal. You just have to uh, change the name of the command and everything works the same. And it's really important when you want to refactor your pipelines that deal with import, you just uh, change basically one letter and then you distribute your stuff ac across the cluster. Uh, so I hope I convinced you that for this particular use case, the Fling really gave us benefit, but then uh, we started to think whether this model, this approach is applicable to some other use cases. And um, I will talk about the Hadoop Disk CP utility. And it's, you can consider it actually as a programming, ex uh, programming exercise because this tool is already in the Hadoop, uh, Hadoop distribution. And there is little reason probably to use the Flink tool as a substitution. Uh, but anyway, uh, so what this tool does is it distributes, so if you want to copy big, big amounts of data from, uh, from within cluster or inter-cluster, you can use the Hadoop DSTP tool that would um, spawn the mappers and will parallelize the copying uh, process. Of course, for a small amount of data, you still can use Hadoop FS CP command, but if you have more data, you probably want to use uh, the Hadoop DSTP command. And what it essentially does is actually it enumerates all the files from the source directory, splits them in the more or less equally sized blocks, depending on the size, and fits them into the mapper. And the input format for DCP comes in two flavors. Our first one is uniform size input format that just pre-splits and then runs mappers. Uh, um, but in such a case, some mappers can be slower, and therefore the runtime of the whole tool depends on the slower mapper. 
Uh, therefore, the Hadoop guys introduced dynamic input format that would somehow dynamically allocate the, wor the work payload to the mappers and in such a way faster mappers will get more work to be done. So as a programming exercise, we decided to implement the same thing uh, using Flink, and, we'll, and we went for the dynamic input format, and it was actually uh, super easy again. So we implemented a custom input format that reads the directory structure and emits uh, one by one the file to be copied to the flat map operator. And flat map operator, what it essentially does, it just opens the HDFS input stream, copies it over to another HDFS location, and closes the stream. In this particular example uh, or setup, it's a bit different because we write to HDFS directly to the, from the mapper, and we, um, for the sake of completeness of the program, we're just utilizing the empty uh, data sync. But that's what actually Hadoop guys are doing uh, anyway, in the in their implementation, and I've done some benchmarks, and actually the runtime was more or less the same. Actually, it took uh, two minutes faster on one terabyte of data using Flink version, probably because of the, of the uh, initialization steps. But I would say this runtime. Yeah, the same runtime is really expected because both tools uh, do the same thing. They copy uh, the streams over, over HDFS. Of course, this tool is still pretty simple. It's, by the way, available in the master uh, uh, in the Flink source code. So you can check it out. Uh, of course, this tool is uh, simpler than Hadoop DCP. It doesn't uh, take care about fault tolerance. Uh, yet, um, it doesn't have all the options of the different modes, how you overwrite files, or you want to substitute, or you want to fail if the target director exists, and uh, stuff like that. But for the sake of this example, I want to keep it uh, really, really simple. So, coming to conclusions, uh, for us, uh, Flink was indeed like a super simple means to develop uh, a simple YARN application that would distribute a load for independent, uh, independent computational tasks across the cluster. And thanks to the, uh, the, f the very nice file input, for of input format interface that makes it super easy uh, to, to manage the input splits of your data. And uh, yeah, we didn't have to write actually too much, too much code. It was just a couple of lines for gluing things together. And again, if you want to look, just go to the, to the examples of the DCP utility. Of course, uh, what would be nice to have in this setup is, first of all, the elasticity. So when you want to, for example, run a a uh, really huge copy task, but you don't want to overblock the cluster. You want to r probably run it in a uh, different queue and adjust automatically to the load of the cluster. The next thing would be better progress tracking. When you copy files or when you import stuff from MongoDB or s uh, stuff like that, you want to track how many records were processed, how many files were processed, what's the overall progress, and stuff like that, and fault tolerance. Now you have to deal with it yourself. If a mapper fails, then you have to retry it on your own. But an anyway, these are more generic things, and it's not only applicable to our use cases, but probably in the whole Flink infrastructure. And I'm pretty sure the Flink guys are working hard on it um, to solve it. So um, to conclude, again, maybe look at the example, and maybe you find uh, your own use cases that you never had time to implement because they seem to be too complicated. So thanks. And by the way, if you want to have fun, constant fun with Flink, make sure to visit the page that is down there. Thanks.
Yeah, maybe a minor question. So you said that you're using Flink for interactive machine learning. Which models are you using at ResearchGate? We're actually using it not for the model-based machine learning, but for the iterative approaches for that when we rely on some sort of convergence. So um, I'm not sure but I can tell you much more about that. But. Hello, thanks for uh, your presentation. I have a question maybe uh, like uh, uh, in uh, your uh, roadmap. Are you planning to use the Flink for other uh, use case? And uh, if you don't mind sharing a little bit about that. Uh, you mean such kind of use cases? Yeah, and other ones besides the couple uh, ones that you shared with us today. Yeah. Mm. Of course, we are expanding the areas of expertise uh, or areas of applicability of Flink. And uh, as I mentioned, we also getting rid of five queries. We for more and more Hadoop jobs uh, to it, we are uh, we implementing new stuff mostly in Flink, and we try all to educate Flink not only the developers but the also analytics team that is on the border between programming and non-programming. Uh, but regarding the such kind of use cases where you take already some module and then somehow uh, plug it in with really little efforts we still have to find use cases for this but I think we will encounter them naturally in the future yeah if there are no more questions then thanks for the talk again <laughs>